Chapter 11. And as usual, we start off with an excerpt from Dr. Chen's notes. I saw a stormbird in the heavens, high above us, rising like a cloud. It was a terror. Its aspect was monstrous. Its mouth was flame. Its breath, obliteration. And that is from the Epic of Gilgamesh, Tablet 4. Mark watched the evacuation on the monitors while keeping one eye on the display of the volcano. G-Team was supervising the airlift in the town square, but there were hundreds left to go and the crowd was in a full panic. That only grew worse when the ground began to shake and the volcano rumbled. When Barnes and the others first arrived, they found a sleepy little fishing town with a nice town square, surrounded by colourful old buildings and not much going on at all. But now it was freaking chaos. At first it was a rush to the docks, whole families piling into fishing boats, headed for the mainland. But now that all of the boats were gone, and the airlift had been set up in the town square, it was all coming down on them. Too many people, too few aircraft, and not enough time. What's got them so rattled, he wondered aloud. Nothing's happened yet. When Monarch Martinez replied, five years ago maybe nobody knew what that was, but now they do. You don't think anyone here believes our bullshit story that the volcano's about to go boom, do you? They have TV here too, you know. They know why Monarch shows up. Monsters. Barnes nodded. Yeah, that's fair, he said, silently counting the people climbing onto the offspray. A group still waiting surged forward, trying to get around. One at a time, Barnes yelled. Back up. But they didn't, or at least not much. What could he do? Shoot them? No. But things couldn't keep going like this either. A piercing shriek suddenly split the air, not a claxton or an alarm, like nothing he'd ever heard. But it shut everybody up, while well, that and the earth shaking under their feet. Weirdly silent, everyone turned to stare at the volcano overlooking the town. Hell, it looked like their fake story was real after all. The quaking grew stronger, dust and small pebbles danced in the town square, dogs howled off in the distance, the top of the mountain burst open, belching flame and black ash into the sky. Eerily, there was no sound, just the rapidly expanding cloud, an ejector streaming off like Roman candles. A few seconds later, the noise arrived. Like a thousand bombs going off at once, Barnes felt the shock against his face. Things were getting more fun by the second. A volcanic eruption on an inhabited island was bad enough in itself, but Mark was right. This was just the beginning. He didn't know what specifically to expect, with the exception of the mutos that Godzilla duked off in San Francisco. No two known titans looked alike. To his knowledge, anyway, he'd been out of the loop for a long time. But if he had to, he would bet that whatever was sleeping in the nest of the demon was unlike anything he'd ever seen before. But it would be big, and it would be deadly. Amidst the smoke and flames, a silhouette drew up from the volcano and spread. Yeah, wings. Big, burning wings that looked as if they were made from half-cooled lava. But at least this one only had one head. More than anything, this titan resembled a flying reptile, but it wasn't exactly that. It had a crest spearing out from the back of its skull, but its beak was a cruel, hooked affair. Its wings looked like the black skin of a cooling lava flow, still molten within, and of course, it was hundreds of times larger than any flying creature previously known, and it was on fire. Rodan rose from the volcanic furnace, like the mythical phoenix, shedding flame and lava, reaching for the sky. 
but it did not take to the air. It seemed to be taking the situation in, eyeing the town, the offspray as the jet screaming by. Got a catchy name for this one? Mark asked Chen. Local legends call it Rodan, the fire demon, she informed him. Well, that's comforting, Mark said. I'm picking up the orca, Dr. Stanton said. Looks like she's piping into the base remotely. That could be useful. They hadn't recorded Emma's Monster Zero soundtrack, but if he could compare the signal she was sending Rodan to the one she used on Mofra, he might be able to tease out how she was doing this. Record it, Mark said. I need a sample. Stanton nodded. Guys, Coleman said, remember the tropical storm where we lost Monster Zero? Well, it's changing direction. Guess where it's headed now? Mark looked at the radar image. It had not only changed direction, it was speeding up, coming right at them. That's not possible, Stanton said. No storm moves that fast. Unless that's not a storm, Chen said. Oh man, Coleman said, as realization dawned. Monster Zero wasn't hidden in the storm. He was making it. We need time to finish the evacuation, Serizawa said. But you better hurry, because it's closing in fast, Stanton said. Mark stared at the prehistoric beast in its nest of lava. If they fought this thing here, now, the people below would not only have to contend with the monster, but with the missile sent askew, like the one that had nearly punched his ticket back in Antarctica. Along with the crashing aircraft's stray rounds of ammunition, and who knows what else. But then he realized something. Maybe they didn't have to fight it at all. Sarazawa Mark said, let it go. Everyone stared at him in disbelief. Seriously? Stanton said. What is wrong with you? He pointed to the radar image of the approaching storm. I think that thing is responding to Big Bird's cries, Mark explained. That means it's coming here for food, a fight, or something more intimate. What do you suggest? Sarazawa asked. All fighters, weapons free, Colonel Foster said. She didn't have to tell them twice. The jets screeched by, unloading their missiles at Rodan, the fire demon. Mark doubted conventional explosives would matter much to an animal that had napped for a few million years in a lake of molten rock, but it might just piss it off. The white contrails of the rockets converged on the monster. They popped on him like bottle rockets and seemed to do about it as much damage. But the winged behemoth had clearly noticed them. His angry gaze searched the skies, dismissing the smaller craft and centering his glare on the Argo. It didn't matter whether the missiles had actually caused Rodan pain. What Mark was counting on was the monster interpreting their attack as a challenge to his dominance an invasion of his territory by another flying, top-tier predator. And no self-respecting giant burning monster bird thing could let that slide, could he? I think we've got his attention, Mark cried. Everyone strap in, Foster said. All ships follow our lead. The Argo banked hard and ran like hell, the jet fighters right behind her. Pissed, Rodan leapt free of the volcano, spreading his wings and taking to the air, dragging flame and lava, smoking like a burning fuel dump. The chase was on. Mariana gripped Matteo's hand harder as the demon emerged from the volcano and sat enthroned in flame. Her great-grandmother's tale of Rodan had scared her when she was little, but no words she or anyone else could say could ever live up to the terrifying reality. Satan himself could not be as terrible. Was this the apocalypse? Had the end of times come? Matteo, we must run faster, she said. 
The boy turned to look at Rodan, his face transfigured by terror. Don't look, she said. Just run and say a prayer. As her grandson began mumbling a prayer, she said her own. God protect my little one, she whispered. Keep my Mateo from harm. But she knew God heard everything, not just what she spoke aloud. So he knew what was in her heart. You took my Maristol too young. You owe me. They reached the square, but the crowd was thick, and everyone was behaving like they were crazy. Men and women she had known her whole life elbowed her back. They were changed. Her people changed by the wicked, wicked demon. He had hardened their hearts. But at least she and Matteo were in the square. The soldiers were doing their best to get everyone on the helicopter. She could see that. But there might not be time. She looked back. The demon was still in his nest. Maybe he would stay there a while longer. Maybe they would get to the helicopter. But then the monster lifted his wings, beat them like a gargantuan bird of prey. He tore free of the mountain and flew towards the village. Then no one was in line anymore. There was no point. They fled in terror. But Marina didn't. She stared at Rodan as he approached, watching as the most distant houses in the village seemed to bow down beneath the wind from those terrible wings. Black smoke followed him as if the sky itself was on fire. The thunder she remembered from her great-grandmother's stories. And then the thunder came. She recognized it as a sonic boom, like those caused by the fighter jets that sometimes did maneuvers over the sea. But this one shook her to her bones. She still held Matteo's hand, but she knew she had failed him. Down the street, the debris-laden wind came, but she could not make herself move. Then someone grabbed her, dragging her from where she stood, rooted, pulling her and Matteo into a lane between the buildings. And then the wind struck, stronger than any hurricane wind she'd ever felt. Roofs tore from the buildings above her, windows became glittering confetti, the blast picked up cars and sent them end over end through the houses and streets. Those still in the square were swept from their feet. The wind caught Matteo and tried to carry him off, but one of the soldiers grabbed him, kept him from being hurled away by the thunder of the demon's wings. Hang on, kid, the man shouted. The wind died as quickly as it had come. Marina gasped at the devastation of her town, at the lava pouring from the volcano. Come on, you two, the man who had saved them said. Let's get you out of here. What about our house? Matteo asked as they followed the soldiers. We have our lives, she told him. For that we must thank God and these men and women. I almost lost you, Matteo. How could I bear that? All of our things, our house, they don't matter. These people have preserved for us the only thing that matters. A house can be replaced. In the distance, the volcano rumbled. They might die yet, she realized. They probably would. Now be strong, she told her grandson. Pay attention to the soldiers. Do what they say, and we will be fine. Rodan caught up with the fleet far quicker than seemed reasonable. Hell-bent on destroying the threat on his domain. Gold Squadron, their jet escort, flew interference, trying to slow the monster's advance, but they were paying an awful price. As Mark watched, Rodan snatched jets from the sky with his clawed feet and sent them flaming towards the ocean below. When it caught the Argo, they wouldn't face any better. But they didn't have to stay ahead of him forever, just long enough to get where they were going. But even that would be a challenge. Rodan was still burning, Mark noted, like an aircraft going down, trailing black smoke. As first he'd hoped that it was a good sign, but now he saw the locals had it right. Rodan was a fire demon, 
carrying the blaze with him wherever he went, just as Godzilla had his blue radiation and Monster Zero had his golden lightning stuff. Maybe the monarch scientists had it wrong. They kept telling him the Titans were part of the natural order, but he didn't see it. How could that be natural? Maybe the Titans didn't arise when the rest of life on Earth did. What if they weren't part of life as we know it at all? What if they came before, when there was no water or free oxygen, when everything was a volcanic hellscape, the atmosphere a perpetual lightning storm, when radiation sleeted from the sky and pulsed from the ground at levels that would strike a human dead in the time it took to draw a breath of the poisonous atmosphere. The earth was like that for billions of years. Before it started to rain, the sky to cool, seas to form, before bacteria, before the first photosynthetic organism started pumping oxygen into the air. Plenty of time for another kind of life to evolve, based on some other chemistry that didn't need water or oxygen. It was easy to believe, watching the terrible flaming bird gain on them, that life as they knew it was just a pale attempt to imitate what came before. Those early creatures that mostly perished when the rains arrived. Only a few adapted, survived to live in an oxygen atmosphere. Became immortal. No, not immortal. The Mutos had been killed. The rest of them could be as well. Griffin had almost been caught off guard by Rodan's sonic boom, or whatever the hell that was. In that last second, she had managed to turn the rotors to plane mode and kick into the wind, but that didn't save the craft from being dinged up pretty well by the flying debris. She was running diagnostics, swearing under her breath as they loaded up the refugees. Is it gonna fly? Barnes asked Griffin. Maybe, she said. One of the engines is damaged. I can't tell how bad, but there may be more. Might be better to put her in the shop, you know? We have to get these people out of here, Martinez said, nodding at the handful of villages that remained. Why, Griffin asked. Big Bird already took off, chasing the Argo. They're probably safer here than shut up in the air. Yeah, I wouldn't go that far, Barn said, pointing to the volcano. Another gigantic plume of ash had just belched out of it, bigger than the last. But rather than rising into the air, this looked like an avalanche or a mudslide coming down the mountainside. Okay, Griffin said. I say we get the hell out of here. Everybody strap in, Barnes yelled. Now! Griffin started the engines and turned the rotors up. One of the engines coughed and smoke started to pour out. Yeah, Griffin said. Hang in there, baby! The offspray seemed reluctant to leave the ground, and the smoking engine was making a funny noise. Barnes looked back at the volcano. The wall of ash was coming, and fast. Hurry up, Griffin, he said. This shit's about to go down. You worry too much, Chief, Griffin said. You need to do some yoga or something. Relax. Martinez was trying to calm the passengers down. It's all right, he was saying. This is normal. Griffin here is the best pilot on the team. I'm the only pilot on the team, Griffin said, but I'll take it. They were picking up speed now, but it still didn't look like they were going to make it. Above it, Barnes said. We need to be above it. What's it anyway, Griffin asked. Pyrolactic flow, Barnes said. Griffin arched her brow at him skeptically. Hey, he said. I took a geology class. It's not just the heat and ash. There's also gas. Hang on, chief, Griffin said. They had only just barely cleared the buildings, and then only because most of them were missing their tops. She tilted the rotors forward and gunned it. They dropped about ten feet during the switch as the wings sought to catch wind. We're not going fast enough, he yelled. Then the wind hit them from behind. He smelled sulfur, and his eyes and nose burned. It felt like a giant's hand had just slapped the offspray in the back. Barnes smelled the sulfur and ash now, and realized he couldn't breathe. Ahead of the Argo stirred a storm that blotted the sky, a boiling mass of iron-colored clouds with burning hearts of lightning. They were fleeing one monster right into the mouths of another, Mark thought. Wonderful. Whose plan had this been? All right, his.
I'll go to Gold Squadron, Stanton broadcast. Let's lure this turkey away from the mainland and straight towards Monster Zero. ETA, two minutes. Copy, the reply came back. The pilot was on screen, along with his handle, Cobra. Start the clock. Gold Squadron doubled back and fired on Rodan. A few missiles hit him, which didn't phase the beast much at all. He lifted to fly above the squadron. Just as they ha were beneath him, he clapped his wings with such force that the three jets were simply slapped from the sky by the shockwave. The same beat of his wings sent him straight up like a burning spear aimed at heaven, where he vanished into the clouds. Was Rodan breaking off the attack? Had they managed to get through the rock-like hide? But then he came screaming back down from a different angle, like an eagle swooping on sparrows, catching the jets off guard, crushing two of them with his clawed feet, and biting one as it exploded. The wreckage spun down to the ocean below. Cobra was still there, but Rodan was right behind him, and gaining fast. On oh my six, the pilot shouted. I can't break off, ejecting! Mark watched as the pilot ejection seat rocketed from the doomed plane. Rodan swallowed the pilot, seat and all. Cobra's monitor went offline. Cobra's Raptor is off the team, Stanton announced. ETA to Monster Zero, 60 seconds. Rodan's snack hadn't done much to deter him. He was coming up swiftly on the main squadron. Duster, 223, Foster said. He's on your tail, get out of there. I'm losing control, I'm lose- His craft spun away and crashed into the sea. Then Rodan rolled, its flaming pinioned wings sweeping through the air as if drilling a hole in the sky. It seemed to happen in slow motion, but Mark watched in horror as the spinning monster's wings swatted jets from the sky like bugs. When Rodan finished his roll, Gold Squadron no longer existed. The pilot's feed winked in and out in quick succession. The Argo was alone. We lost the squadron, Stanton said. ETA to Monster Zero, 30 seconds. Engines whining, the Argo rattled as they raced into the hurricane. Rodan right smack in their rear view. The sun vanished as they were engulfed in the rolling fringes of the tempest. The Argo shuddered as lightning struck her repeatedly. ETA to Monster Zero, 10 seconds, Stanton said. It was too late. Rodan had caught up with them. He reached out to grab the Argo with his talons. Lightning fled again, and a three-headed silhouette appeared through the clouds. Heads and claws darted for them. Rodan stretched and veered away, abandoning his pursuit of the Argo. But there was Monster Zero, right there. Rodan had the right idea. Dive! Foster commanded. Dive! Weight vanished as the craft turned down and dropped. Above them, the two titans clashed together, locked claws, and began to fall, whirling and twisting, biting and clawing each other. <laughs> Gravity returned as the Argo finally leveled out. A little more than an inch above the water, the pilot kicked the engines into high gear, trying to get as far from the monsters as possible, as quickly as possible. How are we still alive? Mark wondered, but it had worked. All of these things wanted to be top dog. Monster Zero had been on his way to put Rodan in his place already. They just sped up the process. Stanton was glued to the radar. Jesus, he said, they're killing each other. Better them than us, Mark said. The radio crackled, and then the voice of Chief Warren Officer Barnes. Mayday! Mayday! Come in, Argo! This is Raptor 1. Do you read? Copy, Raptor 1, Foster replied. What is your status? We're screwed, that's what. And we have kids on board. We're gonna need immediate mid-air retrieval. Colonel Foster swung around. Lock into their positions, she said, and prepare the hangar for emergency landing. Hangar doors are unresponsive, Stanton said. Manual override? They're stuck, Stanton clarified. Mark was tired of being a fly on the wall. Maybe he could actually do something. Which way to the hangar, he asked. I can show you, Coleman replied. Anyone else, Mark asked. I know the way, Coleman replied. Come on. Hope you have a big wrench, Stanton called after them. When they reached the hangar, 
deck officers had already tore open the control console where they were desperately trying to patch cables to get the doors open. It didn't look like they were having much success. The place was full of fire and smoke. What's the problem? Coleman asked. The hydraulic systems are jammed, the officer said. I'm trying to jumpstart power. It's not looking good. Sarazawa leaned in, studying the two titans as they fought their way across the sky. At times the battle was hidden by storm clouds, but Rodan's frame and Monster Zero's flashing breath were visible in the musk. Mark had guessed correctly that Rodan's emergence had drawn Monster Zero's attention, that the three-headed dragon could not tolerate competition. But Sarazawa sensed something else was going on. Despite Stanton's comment, he wasn't certain Monster Zero was trying to kill Rodan, so much as dominate him. That was not the case when he fought Godzilla. That suggested Emma was right in guessing that Godzilla and Monster Zero were in a class by themselves, apex predators that stood above the other titans. Ultimately, the real struggle for dominance would be between the two of them. If the rest of Emma's thesis was correct, that the last confrontation between Godzilla and Monster Zero had ended with Godzilla triumphant and the dragon frozen in ice. And given how things had gone in Antarctica, Monster Zero was trying to build his strength before facing his ancient foe again. He had never been more certain that Godzilla's place in the world was to restore balance. What he was not sure of was what Monster Zero's role was. The Mutos Godzilla killed five years before had been going about the business of their life cycle, eating and reproducing. But while they had been ruthless killers, he hadn't sensed any particular malice in them. They defied that sort of anthropomorphism. But Monster Zero seemed evil. It was a concept that did not sit easy with him. The Titans were part of the world, had been long before humanity. They simply were. A carnivore was not evil because it sought living prey, it was simply how it was built. And he was suspicious of his own feelings. Monster Zero had killed Viveni. It would be all too easy to let grief bait him into the same trap Mark was captive to. Monster Zero struck Rodan a crushing blow, jagging the other monster with lightning and sending him into the ocean, throwing up a huge plume of water and steam. Then Monster Zero turned his attention to the Argo, and once more Serizawa was sure he saw spite in the triple gaze as it began beating across the water toward them. The control panel bleeped, a call was coming in. It's Admiral Stan, Stanton said. Serizawa immediately felt wary. Stans was a good man, a capable leader of men. They had worked together on the Muto attacks. But he lacked imagination, and he did not understand the Titans, even after Godzilla behaved as Serizawa predicted, defeating the Mutos, and then returning to the sea. Stans was still skeptical of the Titans' intentions, Moreover, he was an instrument of the government which had been trying to prey jurisdiction over the Titans from Monarch for a while now. About that, Emma was correct. If they got control of the Great Beasts, they would kill them, or at least attempt to. Like Emma, he believed that the consequences of doing so would be catastrophic. He disapproved of her conclusions and methods, but he didn't disagree with her diagnosis. Stans appeared on screen. A little grayer, a few more lines in his long, rugged face. Admiral, Serizawa said. As usual, Stans went straight to the point. Dr. Serizawa, Colonel Foster, I need you and the rest of your forces to immediately disengage and withdraw to a safe distance. Admiral, Foster said, I don't understand. We've been developing a prototype for a new weapon, the Admiral said, an oxygen destroyer designed to exterminate all life from within two mile radius. With any luck, it will kill these things, and thus the nightmare will finally be over. Admiral Serzawa said, we must keep our faith in Godzilla. I'm sorry, Doctor, Stan said. You had your chance. The missile's already on its way. May God have mercy on us all. The screen went dark, but on the radar, the missile was now visible. 
He's not lying, Colonel Foster said. It's coming in hot. In the hangar, things weren't going very well. Far from feeling helpful, Mark was starting to wonder what he was even doing down here. At this point, it was clear to everyone that no amount of tinkering with the electrical system was going to resolve the problem. The offspray was trailing smoke and flying even more unsteadily by the moment. Something had to happen, and soon. He studied the control panel, knowing it was pointless that the problem wasn't on that end. But then one of the switches caught his eye, and he remembered the offspray drop over Antarctica from this very hangar. They'd been clamped above, and there had been a spare. He looked up, and there it was, clamped above them, another offspray. He didn't feel like talking them through this. They might try and stop him, and Barnes and the others were out of time as it was. So he shoved the deck officer aside. What the hell do you think you're doing? The officer yelped. Mark ignored him and pushed the offspray release button. Griffin was doing her best, but Barnes could see they weren't going to be in the air much longer. Not in this weather. They were lucky to be here at all, and if Griffin had been a lesser pilot, they wouldn't be. She had used the gaseous edge of the pyroclastic flow to come up to airspeed, but that hadn't been easy on the already damaged offspray. If he'd known how bad things were, he might have pointed Griffin towards the mainland instead of trying to rejoin the squadron. Now it was too late for that. It was the Argo or nothing. The hatch blew open, and something fell through it. It took a heartbeat to realize it was the spare offspray, which they were going to hit. Look out, Barnes screamed, but Griffin dodged just enough. The second craft splashed into the ocean. It wasn't pretty, but they had a hole to shoot for now. Hold on, Griffin shouted, and punched the offspray towards the now open hangar bay. The engines coughed as she pushed them to their limits. Behind him, the townspeople were praying together. He hoped it helped. They came in hot and smoking, hit the deck, skipped and skipped across it, and nearly slammed into the far wall, before finally grinding to a stop. He let out his breath. Okay, he thought. He glanced at Griffin, who seemed unruffled. Yoga, huh? Maybe there was something to that. Barnes stumbled out of the vehicle. Mark and Sam were there to meet him. Thanks for the lift, he told Mark. Mark didn't have a chance to reply, rising over the whirling and the wind through the open hangar. They all heard a familiar roar and saw that Monster Zero was almost on top of them, skimming low across the waves. Damn, Barnes thought. It had been a nice try. He glanced at his passengers and felt for them. He had signed up for this, but what had they done to be thrown into such a mess? To have their homes, their town destroyed, and now their lives taken. Dr. Russell had a lot to answer for. He took a deep breath and waited for the impact. He reached for his sidearm, maybe if he could put a round or two in its eye. Below, the ocean bulge lifted and sprayed up, smashing into Monster Zero. But it wasn't a freak wave, it was a hell of a big lizard. Godzilla had caught up with them. He smashed into the flying monster in mid-flight and slammed him into the water, like a killer whale taking down a seal. Everyone in the hangar cheered, even Mark in fact. From the corner of his eye, Barnes thought he caught the zoologist doing a little fist bump. But they didn't have time for a long celebration. What are you all gawking at? Barnes shouted at the others. Move! 